Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this Wednesday afternoon for the last installment of our 2023 Rocky Mountains Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit, or CESU, online seminar series. My name is Lisa Gerloff, and I'm the Executive Coordinator for our CESU. These talks have been a great way and a fun way for us to showcase the talent and work of our CESU partners. Our theme this year um, is understanding, documenting, and interpreting human history and cultural resources within our Western landscapes. We've already had some outstanding seminars. Um, Doug McDonald, uh, University of Montana, Montana archaeology professor kicked us off back in February, February 9th, um, uh, giving us an overview of his 17 years documenting cultural resources in and around uh, Yellowstone National Park. And then on March 9th, Boise State University uh, history professor Bob Reinhardt joined us to share about his public history project the Atlas of Drowned Towns that explores the uh, histories of communities uh, inundated by dam construction in the 20th century. Both those presentations were recorded and are available on our seminar page. And I'll share the link to that page um, with you shortly in our, in our chat box. Uh, today, I'm excited to have Kat Vlahos with us. Kat is a professor of architecture and historic preservation at the University of Colorado, Denver. She served as the chair of the Department of Architecture from 2013 to 2019, and as the director of the Center of Preservation Research from 2008 to 2020. Kat's experience and scholarship focuses on the development of innovative innovative methods to broaden our understanding of cultural landscapes that define uh, the American West. She has been active in the Rocky Mountain CESU with uh, more than a dozen projects with agencies over the, the last 10 or so years and represents uh, UC Denver on our Rocky Mountain CESU Executive Committee. Kat will speak for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we will have plenty of time for questions. I'm happy to uh, leave the screen and, and turn it over to Kat. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, come here and talk about the work that we've been engaged in and to reflect on our partnerships uh, over the past years. Uh, we've been working through and with the C um, CSU and many of the agencies for about 15 years now. And um, really they've been, this partnership has been at the core of the research, uh, education and preservation work that we engage in at the university. Uh, I, I think what has been so incredibly um, uh, uh, key to the work that we've been doing is the building of long-term relationships with our partners and really looking at uh, developing these innovative methods together uh, to look at how we could document uh, many of the rural landscapes, uh, as we said, that define the American West. Uh, what I'll be presenting today is uh, how we developed the relationships and how we engaged in those partnerships uh, with the agencies, um, not only for our contracted work, but also uh, looking for opportunities to work together uh, and discovering uh, new ways to think about the tangible and intangible resources that we inherited and how to become better stewards of, of preservation, which we pass on to our students in their own education. I'll uh, begin my presentation with kind of a brief overview of, of the state of Colorado and um, my own personal research, uh, which is the, 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 the turning point for us in developing the relationship with the CSU and the agencies. Um, it also led to an opportunity to build the Center of Preservation Research, and I'll talk to you about uh, the model that we used because that truly was the mechanism by which we engaged students and faculty um, and research associates to uh, engage in the work uh, with the Park Service, with the BLM, and some of the other um, 
uh, groups that we worked with. And then I'll also show a couple of examples of documentation processes that we've um, worked on over the years as um, sort of case studies. So the key piece for us has been that we really have had tremendous growth, as many states in the West have, uh, over the last 25-year period. And in that, uh, as we began to see and understand, was um, a loss of our heritage, a loss of our cultural resources, um, and in many ways, limited capacity of our preservation specialists to address uh, the impact that was happening uh, in the state. Uh, between 2010 and 2020, it was really one of the fastest growing with nearly doubling its population in the last 40 years. Uh, as you can imagine, this had an impact not only on the urban scape and the, and the rural scape, but on many of our, our parks and, and federal lands. Uh, we have an incredibly rich history, as do many of, of our, our regional states, uh, and really looked at uh, finding ways to think about the documentation of our agricultural history, our mining history, and our ancient sites. That was really what was starting to drive much of the work that I was engaged in. Specifically, I engaged in the agricultural landscapes and the cultural landscapes. Uh, one of the benefits that we have here in Colorado when we think about preservation is about 28% of all the gaming revenue comes back into preservation. So we have an incredibly um, a robust uh, preservation program here, but it still uh, shows that less than 10% of our resources have been identified, surveyed, and documented. When uh, we started working with the CSU, uh, as I mentioned in my own personal work, I was looking at the impact that development was having on much of the cultural landscapes in the in the rural areas of our um, state. I think that uh, what I also recognized in that process was I had limited capacity to document very large landscapes. I've always been engaged in looking at the vernacular architecture, studying it, uh, studying it as um, models for sustainable passive approaches to design as an architect. Um, I came out of practice into the university system and always felt that there was a, a lot of knowledge um, that we could draw from many of these places. In addition, really looking at the cultural landscapes as models for sustainable uh, planning and design. Uh, when I think about the methods that I've engaged in, I really looked at documentation as an act of developing visual evidence. And that could happen either in uh, drawing or reconnaissance and intensive survey, uh, looking at identifying and evaluating historic resources uh, throughout the state, looking at um, assessment as an act of looking at the physical condition of the resource, and using that information to uh, inform preservation planning, uh, to inform action that can be taken either for a cultural resource or a community. Uh, my own design. Uh, approach really starts to look at, and my teaching as well, are shaped around this principle that multiple kinds of evidence can promote informed decision-making as we work as designers and as architects. Um, and it, it can inform a course of action that helps meet either the needs of a community or uh, the interpretation of a resource or its management. Uh, also, evidence is really at the base of developing a societal commitment or a responsibility for the stewardship of our cultural heritage. So the National Park Service uh, was really the first agency that I began to work with. And as I was working uh, with my students, we used, this is a National Register Bulletin to really start to understand beyond the vernacular, how we would think about larger cultural landscapes and how we would start to document those areas. Um, we really have worked through uh, the documentation process in a way that engages multiple generations of people. Uh, this is a, an example up in the northwest part of the state where students would be on site. Uh, they would be taking classes specifically in documentation or in preservation or the study of uh, the vernacular uh, cultural landscape and regional issues and would be on site to learn about these particular places. 
And in that process of learning about design, they would also draw. And we were, this was hand drawing. Um, we were using traditional methods to not only create the HABs drawings, um, but also creating uh, architectural inventory surveys of many of these sites. These were used then in turn for planning purposes and preservation planning uh, in the counties. As many of the homeowners and landowners would tell us, they didn't have the time to actually go out and think about preservation, but it was something that was incredibly important to them. So it was a wonderful partnership um, between the students, the university, and the landowners but it also engaged the National Park Service because they were a critical piece of helping us work through that process of developing the HABs drawings that would eventually go into uh, the Library of Congress and, and their um, permanent uh, archives. In this process, um, I had the, I guess the, the benefit of working with uh, Greg Kendrick and Tom Cohan and Christine Whitaker uh, here in the regional office of the Park Service. And Tom Cohen in particular was working with me on these HABs drawings. And in conversation, what we began to understand is uh, there was an interest in researching uh, documentation processes beyond the traditional HABs uh, process. We were looking to develop measurable information on large uh, scopes of land. Uh, we were looking for efficient data gathering methods. Um, we wanted something that was non-invasive in, in gathering that data. And also there were times where we would be on these sites and knew we needed to gather more data for future, potentially future needs, but didn't know what those might be. So uh, it happened um, just by happenstance that uh, uh, SciArc, which is a, a company that looks at the housing of digital data, they have a, their own website, C-Y-A-R-K, um, had, we're looking for universities and the park service at this time to test out the LIDAR scanning. And so this really solidified our first step with the, um, agency and our joint interest in exploring documentation methods. And it's continued to grow and evolve, um, over the year with partners. Uh, one of the things that we did do in, um, working with the, with the ranchers is we were able to write up and talk about the model that we created. This was a model, again, in its traditional measurement and documentation that has gone to several parts of the state. And we realized that there really was a need to find ways to document these cultural resources and to do it efficiently and effectively, uh, and yet to be able to establish a level of quality and drawing that sometimes can be lost um, when you're using only the scanning. So our pilot, our pilot program with the Park Service started with Fort Laramie National um, Historic Site. And Fort Laramie for us was uh, the case study. We were asked to become a technical center uh, to start the LIDAR scanning for the state of Colorado. Uh, and in our partnership with the, uh, our partnership with the agencies, and so as we were looking at um, some of these sites, what we began to do was understand one that Fort Laramie was a large cultural landscape. The partners that were engaged in this process included the CSU, the Park Service, SciArc, and ourselves. Um, and so when we looked at this project for the first time, we actually went into the archives of the, of the park to see what types of documentation they had uh, that they had collected over centuries of time. When we went in and, and started working on the scanning, again, this was our pilot program, so we were all trying to figure out how this technology was going to work. One of the things that emerged from this whole process that we were really amazed by, uh, as you can kind of see on that lower image, uh, were pieces of information that we had not been aware of while we were on site. And this began to open up uh, lots of questions and opportunities. Uh, did this technology uh, capture information that uh, didn't wasn't revealed or that couldn't be seen by the naked eye but was picking being picked up by the um by the scanning and so we got very very excited to say the least um about this and began to look at other possibilities of how we would use lidar scanning this is terrestrial scanning that we were engaging in 
We also were really excited because it gave us the opportunity to not only uh, scan large landscapes in the context of a site, but also the buildings and also areas of the buildings that might need some sort of um, repair or management. And it allowed us to kind of go in and really think about multiple scales of documentation and beginning to think about interpretive work or cultural management work, resource management work, um, and to think about the purpose of the documentation. Uh, one of the things that we did learn is um, along the way is just because you can scan doesn't necessarily mean that you should, um, that it is, is important to understand what the purpose of the data collection is for. So we also um, had the opportunity to pull some 1930s HABs drawings that had been created and to overlay them with the scanned data to see where some of the differences might lie in that data collection, uh, the data collection that was done by hand or the data collection that was done through scanning. So this really opened up a tremendous amount of uh, research opportunities for us and opportunities for us to engage uh, in the documentation of, of multiple sites. Again, this was at the beginning stages of our work together. And uh, what I really greatly appreciated about um, the CSU and working with the Park Service was uh, we were working through many of these pieces together. We knew if we were scanning and developing a body of work that that was a deliverable, but the, the beauty of those partnerships was really being able to have the conversations and the exploration uh, to try to find better ways of, of doing things. So one of the outcomes of this personal work that began and also uh, starting to work as a technical center, uh, which lasted for a couple of years through SciArc, is I um, became the director of the Center of Preservation Research, which is a, a university research center, and it's dedicated to preservation. We had the opportunity to work with several of the agencies um, on different types of projects, ranging from historic context to surveys to documentation. And I'm going to get into a little bit of, of how that relationship has worked um, and how we uh, modeled and structured the work that we were doing with um, the agencies. This kind of gives you a quick overview. Uh, so between 2008 and 2020, I was in the direct as uh, sat in as a director of, of Copper. Um, we went through obviously the pandemic put a, a halt to our being able to be in the field for a couple of years. And we also had a change in our own administration structure. So coming back in, we are no longer working under the umbrella of the center, but we are continuing the work in the same way that we had before. Um, and it's the same type of model, and I'll explain that. But over that 15-year uh, period, we had about uh, 1.5 million in funding for our graduate students and our undergrad students to engage in preservation projects. As you can see, 70% of the work that we uh, were engaging in came through the CSU and came through the federal agencies. Uh, the majority of them were documentation projects. Uh, the next one was our survey projects, and those seem to be more state level, um, History, Dem uh, History Colorado and the State Historic Fund. But the majority of our projects uh, were documentation. Uh, and then the yellow piece really was kind of the private sector began to um, engage and be involved and interested in the LIDAR scanning approaches. So this uh, shows basically how we structured the center. Um, as a director, I was able to work with uh, professionals who had expertise in survey documentation and assessment. Um, and they came in as research associates, and so we were able to work together in multiple areas of preservation. Uh, what you see here outlined in gray are the classes that were specific to the Masters of Science in Historic Preservation. Our college has uh, graduate programs in architecture, landscape architecture, planning, urban design, and preservation, historic preservation. So we were able to begin to tie uh, coursework to uh, the work that the students needed for their degree, but also for work that could come into the center and be applied to contracted and granted work. 
I'm going to focus specifically on the documentation piece of this. Um, I taught along with uh, one of my colleagues the documentation analysis and representation course and a class on regionalisms in the vernacular. Um, the class would then, uh, and as you can see to the right side, we had our, our CSU agencies. We partnered with state, local, and, and professionals as well as preservation organizations. The way that the uh, flow and the partnership worked is internally we had faculty who were engaging in their courses. Uh, the majority of the courses in the preservation program are, use applied research and hands-on experiential learning when possible. Uh, from that course, for example, if I were teaching the documentation course, typically one to two students would be interested in moving forward and learning more about it. They would be hired by the center by copper uh, under a grant, so they would be paid for the, the position. Then they would engage specifically on a project, uh, for example, a documentation project. Uh, and from that, they would work with myself, they would work with our research associates, and they would work with the um, agencies to kind of work through the processes and, and develop the deliverables. Then the deliverables would move uh, into either dissemination, public dissemination. We always looked for ways to, to show the work that was um, being completed, as well as informing the research further. We would also then uh, deliver that information uh, to the agency or the partner. And then the cycle would start again, where we might get uh, additional funding to do another phase of a project, or it would come into um, the center as a new project. Uh, the beauty of that process has been that several of our graduate students have actually gone on to work with many of the agencies that they were um, connected to through the center. And they in turn now are coming back and hiring us to do additional work, uh, preservation work uh, based on their experiences. So it's been a really lovely um, uh, relationship including the students, including the agencies, including the university, and many of the communities that we work within. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, case studies, and I've just selected one example from each of these areas to talk about, um, but these are, these are studies that I think capture much of the work that we're doing. Uh, this is uh, Canyon of the Ancients Monument is one of the areas that we began working in uh, one of my colleagues, a predecessor of mine, began working in the 1990s. We started in 2000s and really began to look at uh, the resource management plan for the Canyon of the Ancients. It was written in uh, 2010. It's, a, it's an incredible landscape, and uh, it was probably one of the, the most um, impactful places that we were able to take our students to. Uh, it's uh, what we felt was happening in this was that there was a sort of a shift, a paradigm shift in looking at how we would consider uh, developing documentation for um, sites that were public versus sites that were undeveloped. Uh, the this particular area has around thirty thousand archaeological sites that exist in the monument. My understanding is that about eight thousand of them have been identified in some way. And the human impact is really what guides how the 13 developed sites are um, being documented and addressed. So many of these sites are used as outdoor exhibits. They teach people about prehistory, uh, behavior, ethics, right? How to become stewards of uh, sensitive cultural sites. Uh, but all the other sites are not publicly accessible. So people can get to them, uh, but they're not necessarily advertised as public places. The other piece of this that was really important for us was that uh, as part of the agreement, well, as part of the um, thing understanding was that the sites that are not developed would be allowed to return to the earth. And that was, that was um, in consultation uh, with, I think, the tribal elders in the monument. And our approach was to work with the BLM to try and um, document as many sites as we possibly can. The sites, though, in each set of drawings take us somewhere around three years when we're engaging our students in this process. 
And what you see here is what's in gray are the sites that were in, engaged in uh, through traditional hand drawing. And then uh, anything that's in black type here was a combination of analog and digital. Uh, we have found that the digital works for us really well. The LiDAR scanning works very well for us in, on the site, but we still need the hand drawing um, to finish off these drawings and really bring a, an understanding, I think, a better understanding of the site and the structures. So the one that I'm going to share with you here is the Lowry Pueblo. And we had a number of partners on this one, the CSU, CSU excuse me, the BLM, the uh, Park Service, uh, the State Historical Fund engaged in this in helping us um, financially uh, work through setting a, creating a set of um, drawings. SciArc worked with us on our initial site in the monument and then our group. And the thing that we have learned over the years is that it's a very, um, a gentle way of documenting because it is not invasive. And so we spend a lot of time on site, a lot of time though, uh, setting up prior to getting to the site and understanding what we're going to be documenting. The site time itself is drastically cut in comparison to when we were doing work uh, in a traditional measuring way. We gather the raw data and we, on the right-hand side, you can see photo textured, where we've taken photographs from the exact places that the scanning has happened from. And we overlay those pieces of information that we then use to uh, create measured drawings. Uh, this is the translation into the HABs drawings that we did for the Lowry Pueblo. And we have similar sets uh, for the other sites as well. And the data goes from either uh, the data set into a HAB set of drawings, or it goes into a digital archive that can then be used by the agency at a later time. Uh, we're trying to capture as much data of as many sites as we can that are identified uh, by the BLM so that there are those data sets available. And as we said, we don't necessarily know what that data will be used for in the future. It could be for interpretive purposes or uh, some sort of resource management planning but the data will be there. Uh, as part of the dissemination process, uh, we had the opportunity to do a 15 year uh, long reflection on the projects that were developed for the monument by the university, where we produced these drawings. And we were able to do this amazing comparison of what hand drawings look like in say the mid or late 1990s and what they look like today when you're combining the technologies of LIDAR scanning and analog drawing. Um, and also looking at the um, uh, consistency between drawings and the, measurable, the measurable um, access to the drawings. So we put together an exhibit down in, um, on display at the Canyon of the Ancients Visitor Center. It just came down in January um, and really worked through the idea of the living landscape. Uh, the State Historic Fund, as I mentioned earlier, has given us some funding for this project, and we were really pleased to find out that we had received the Stephen H. Hart Award for Historic Preservation. It's an award that is given uh, for a project that um, exemplifies uh, the best of preservation throughout the state. And I'm going to share with you um, just a quick two-minute uh, video. We're at Lowry Pueblo National Historical Landmark in the uh, Canyons of the Ancient National Monument. The Bureau of Land Management's duty is to preserve it. So we have to come in and continuously do maintenance, just like the folks who lived here always had to do maintenance on it. The tools that have developed over the years, uh, laser scanning and photogrammetry, we thought would be great to help us to document its existing state. The purpose was to digitally document Lowry Pueblo. 
and allows folks to now virtually visit this place. The Great Kiva is here and the Great House is here. It creates such an accurate record that if we go back and scan it again in 10 years, we can compare again very accurately what's changed. There's been so many different stabilization strategies done that I think this data will provide really good feedback on what's working and what's not. So here's the main point of entry into a lot of the interior rooms. You start to make out that most interior, larger kiva in the great house. That we have the whole thing laser scanned was, you know, far better than anything we could do by hand. SciArc, they're basically the repository for all the data that we've captured. So SciArc was founded as a repository for all of this digital information that would make it accessible around the globe with the click of a mouse. They were excellent masons. I don't know how many students get the opportunity to go out to a site like this for a whole week and, and really document it. It's a new generation of preservationists, and it's a privilege because they're able to see a historic site. They're able to think about creating drawings and evidence. So this is our set of drawings that we ended up with for the HABS project for Lowry Puebla. The HABS program is the Historic American Building Survey. What the students at University of Colorado Denver were doing is they're creating detailed architectural drawings of this ancestral Pueblo in place. And then these documents will be stored in perpetuity at the Library of Congress. A lot of these ancient sites were sustainable. They were resource efficient. They used materials from the land. They understand the environment within which they were designing. And those are some of the lessons that we should be learning about architecture today. It was really a privilege to work on this project and uh, Vince McMillan uh, it has been sort of our lifeline over the last decade um, to many of these sites and it's been uh, really fun to kind of just think about documentation and again um, I can't emphasize enough the importance for us as as researchers as as scholars as practitioners uh, not only going out into the field and doing the work and teaching and educating our students so that they can go out into the field, but also the um, collaborative effort of working with many of the agencies within the CSU to address problems and work towards solutions. Uh, the next uh, task, uh, the next uh, case study that I want to show you is the documentation work that we've been doing with the Japanese American confinement sites. Uh, this has been part of uh, the JAXA grant program that they have, and we've been able to participate in multiple sites. Uh, the one that I'm going to share with you today is Amache down in Granada. Uh, we had the opportunity to work with Heart Mountain, uh, Tule Lake, and Topaz. The uh, sites uh, on several of these projects, we've gone back twice. Typically, we will work um, on the first site, for example, Amache and Heart Mountain Phase 1, when we go in and we're addressing something very specific, which is geared toward the built structures. Um, for Amache, we were able to work uh, on documenting only the structures. For Heart Mountain, we were actually looking at the tower, which was starting to lean, to determine, again, can LIDAR scanning be used as something that could potentially um, uh, track any sort of shifts and changes that happen in these buildings. And then Tule Lake and Topaz, we were able to go in and scan uh, working with SciArc specifically on these two sites. And then they took that information and used it for interpretive purposes on the website. So we're, our partners on this one was the Amachi Preservation Society, the National Park Service, the CSU, and our program here. And we received funding for all phases of these projects through the JAXA program. Uh, one of the key pieces for our students is that they do a tremendous amount of prep work before they ever go out into the site. And we are, you know, in these wonderfully privileged places where we can actually pull up a, uh, an aerial view or a Google map to really start to look at some of these sites in advance of getting there. So we do a lot of prep work with them, decide and determine what types of um, documentation we want to um, capture. And then when we go to the site, we also still have to assess what's actually on the site. There have been times where 
what we see in a aerial view is not necessarily what still exists there. Um, we can go, the Amachi site in particular was an interesting one because it started to show us um, different ways of thinking about structures and how to document them, those that were in existence, uh, those that were being reconstructed, uh, those that actually had been moved from the site initially, and were now in town instead of on the actual um, uh, confinement site. So the documentation for us was really thinking about a way that um, how it reflected a cultural landscape where people drew upon what traditions they had to develop a community um, and a habitable in, uh, environment in places that oftentimes were considered incredibly hostile, uh, both politically and, in, and as a physical environment. Uh, looking at the reconstruction, uh, understanding the components of these buildings uh, in relationship to each other. Uh, and for example, here is one where it's a building that is not on the site, but was brought into town. So on our first phase, we did go in and, and um, scan all structures that we were aware of that were not on the site to either digitally or physically potentially bring back to the site. And the other elements that speak to the traditions that speak to the importance of, of the community uh, that was there. Um, in addition, we had the opportunity on this particular project to uh, come in with a drone. We have just started to really work with the drone captures. Uh, we were asked to come in uh, because a, a hailstorm had happened and there wasn't clarity on whether or not there had been damage on top of one of the water towers. So we had just purchased a drone for the college and really wanted to give it a try. So we were able to go up there and and check out what had taken place, um, what damage there was, if any, and to document that information. We are moving more into uh, drone capture as well as the terrestrial in the work that we're trying to do. So as I'd mentioned, the first part of this was a capture of structures and buildings. And the second part was a capture of the broader context and the cultural landscape. Here we have a photo textured combination. And then looking for a way to bring those pieces of information together, we are um, combining the data sets so that we have a large view of all the components that make up this particular site. Out of these uh, projects uh, and working again with um, Greg Hendrick in particular at the Park Service was the chance to think about best practices. Uh, this began in about 10 years ago. We wrote this up when we were first starting to look at uh, LIDAR scanning as a potential system for capturing information and preservation purposes. And because the technology is constantly changing and because technology is always very exciting, you know, what were some of the questions that we needed to be addressing? So we worked together to think about how we might um, make recommendations for this type of documentation program and implementation. What it also did was helped us as a research center uh, to develop our own uh, field guides uh, to think about the processing of data and to um, think about the deliverables. We also worked with the BLM, uh, Nefra and Tom, two people who were always in the field, especially with photogrammetry, and were um, helpful to us in this process. Uh, when we uh, looked at this 10 years ago, the things that we were considering at that point in time are still the same challenges and issues that we have today. Uh, our work in progress now is one of revisiting what these best practices look like and what has shifted and changed over the last decade and how we might think about things um, holistically and differently. So the idea of site assessment, where we are trying to have the least invasive approach that we can, thinking about how we're gathering the data and managing it um, and how we try to identify what that data will be used for if possible beforehand. Uh, we use the scanned data, you can see here on the left, uh, lower left hand drawing, um, because it is measurable information. We are able to um, uh, block out what a HAB set will look like far in advance of drawing it. So we now have the, the ability uh, to 
uh, capture and, and cartoon a set of what it is that we want the Habs drawings to look like, and then begin to translate that information through CAD, uh, creating base drawings, such as that one on the right-hand side um, of the entire set. And then how we represent it, how much we used in terms of our own hand drawing and how we add uh, information that maybe is not captured in uh, the CAD drawing or captured in the data, looking at photographs, uh, doing as much as we can in the field to bring that information back. And then archiving, which is really one of our biggest challenges still is how do we archive the data? And when data continues to change and the means of reading data continues to change, how do you archive information so that it's valuable and usable in the future? So we are coming back asking the same questions that we asked a decade ago, but now we have um, a body of work that we can draw from to hopefully advance our understanding and, and answers. The last uh, piece I'm gonna leave you with is kind of the next project that we're working on. Uh, we have worked, the majority of our work has all been rural-based, um, and we are shifting to the urban scape uh, and looking at the changes that are happening in the city of Denver, which you can see there's uh, a lot of parking lots that have now been filled, and trying to understand how data, um, LIDAR scanning and data can help us make more informed decisions as we move forward. The project that we're also looking at specifically is um, Sakura Square. We are tying together what it is that happened after World War II, right, with the Jacks sites, uh, where many people came to Denver to build a community and to build a new life. And Sakura Square is one of these places that uh, has a 1940s um, Buddhist temple, uh, residential tower that was built in the 70s, and a commercial and mercantile area that was built, uh, I think, later in that time. And then also uh, Japanese gardens. And it's become this really incredible uh, city block that is full of life and tradition and culture. And we are starting to go through the scanning process of this particular block. Um, to put this into uh, context, typically when we are on site scanning, we will collect somewhere around 100 scans um, on our rural sites. This one took us about 600 scans. And so we are now in the place of starting to look at how we manage data sets that are large like this, and what information are we learning in this process. Um, I want to thank you, and again, thank uh, Lisa uh, and, and letting me be part of this, because I think the title of this sem uh, series is perfect, how we can actually understand and document and interpret human history and cultural resources within our Western landscape, and to realize how incredibly important they are to our own well-being. Um, I want to thank you and um, answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Kat. You uh, absolutely added to the, the theme of our, our seminar. I do want to open it up to questions. So if you have questions for Kat, would you please um, put those questions in the, the chat box? And while I give you a minute to do that, um, I will just add that um, one of the benefits of the uh, collaborative nature of the, the CESU is to engage and train students to work with the, the agencies. And I always love to hear confirmation that um, you know, students on CESU projects are getting jobs with the, the federal agencies. And I also just want to point out that um, the Rocky Mountain CESU runs a annual student award mm -hmm. that um, recognizes, you know, outstanding contributions by students to CESU projects. And the uh, young woman, the young student, uh, grad student highlighted in the video that Kat showed was um, Kimberly Verhoeven, that mm -hmm. uh, was our 2019, I believe, um, award winner. Right. And I think Julia Oslus may have received one as well earlier. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, it's been an incredible, I think, um, opportunity for the students. And they always uh, come out of either working in the center or working on these projects with a, an entirely different perspective. And I think level of confidence as they're going into their professional work. Um, but it's been it's been lovely to see that cycle of connection. Are there any any questions for for Kat? She did a great job. Oh, there you go. I, I gave you all the information. Well, and I was going to say, you know, if if uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, at cat.blahos at ucdenver.edu. Um, we're always interested in learning more about the work that other people are doing, and and if there's um, opportunities to collaborate, we always look for it. Um, have right. you, um, do, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Um, we do have one question here. Have you in encountered tribal questions, issues, um, collaborations in your work? Yeah, James, thank you for that question. You know, uh, if there are any, it's typically the agency that will work through them. So when we worked on the BLM projects, uh, Vince McMillan, who is our, our connection, um, really has done all the work on his side. So when we come in there, we, we actually don't have any interaction uh, with the tribal members. Um, but we try to be very, very sensitive and careful uh, in those processes, and the BLM has done an exceptional job in letting us uh, know or in helping us understand uh, how we should be proceeding in these sites and what we should be doing. Any other questions for Kat? Great. Well, if there are none, um, I want to uh, thank you, Kat, for, for joining us today. Um, a great presentation. Um, you know, seeing all of your CESU agreements come across my desk, it, it's um, it's really nice to to see the the details um, and uh, the outcomes of, of some of those. All right, we do have one more here. Do you have interactions with historians? Interesting, you are in the College of Architecture. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, the When we first started thinking about um, preservation program, and again, it's all, all these uh, pieces came together in a way that um, allowed us to think about, there was a preservation need in the state because we were growing so quickly and the resources were being impacted. Uh, we had students who were interested in preservation and there was a need for preservationists. So the idea of starting up a, a program made a lot of sense. Uh, and in collaboration with the Department of History and Tom Noel, uh, we started the certificate uh, in historic preservation initially. So we, we definitely worked very closely with the history department. Um, as we began to develop the center's work and began to bring in cohorts of students, uh, we started the Masters of Science in Historic Preservation, and that sat in the college. And primarily because it was a, um, we could put the program together without expending any funds. We were already teaching many of the classes that needed to be taught. But we always had uh, the history department as part of, students would take classes in the history department as part of that master's program. And I think that uh, you're right, it is interesting that it's in the College of Architecture and Planning. Uh, typically you would see preservation programs in the history department. And we felt like that was actually one of the things that set us apart in many ways from other preservation programs. At the time that we started the MSHP, uh, there were only a few programs west of the Mississippi uh, that were addressing um, cultural heritage and, and preservation. Uh, what we have found, and I think it, it's really um, been very valuable, is many of our architecture students um, who don't necessarily think about studying preservation, but take classes that we teach as electives, get really excited about preservation once they're in it. 
and they're incredible at drawing and they're incredible at seeing places. So we try to set up collaborative partnerships between students in multiple programs, including history, preservation, architecture, and the other disciplines. I hope that answered your question. All right, no more questions are popping up in the chat box. So uh, again, I will say um, thank you to, to Kat for joining us today. And thank you for our audience out there um, and your interest in today's seminar and our seminar series. Um, again, uh, this seminar was recorded and we'll add it to the recordings on our seminar page on the, the Rocky Mountain CSU website. Um, and that link will be um, sent out to um, all of you in a couple of days. Um, so thank you everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Kat. Bye.